guys, uh, we're in Acts chapter 2. Sorry, Acts chapter 22. And this is a continuation from last week. Okay. Last week, uh, Paul went to the temple in Jerusalem and there was a riot, a mass riot, because <clears throat> the Jews thought that he brought Gentiles into the temple when he didn't. Anyway, um, we're going to be, that was chapter 21, so we're going to be going into chapter 22. And now that you know the background to this, this is picking up. It's the same story, okay? It's just a continuation of that story. And we're going to read from 22.1 to uh, 21, verse 21, and we'll talk about it. And this is Paul speaking. <clears throat> he says, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. <clears throat> and he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in, C in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them... I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise up, go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that, uh, that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So what did you like about what we read here? Before we answer that question, do you know what Paul was doing here? Telling his story? You're right. 100% Kara. We call that sharing your testimony. He's telling people how he came to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Each one of us has our own story. 
on how we came to know Jesus. Last night, I took Riley to Special Olympics swimming, and there is a lady there who is a worker for spe uh, a special needs girl, and her name is Taylor. She is not a believer, but we got to talking. And I was able to share my testimony, and from that, I was able to share the gospel. Really cool. So, <clears throat> from what I read, how long do you think it took him to share his testimony? Right here. About a minute, two minutes. One thing that you guys want to learn how to do is share your testimony, recite it, rehearse it, do it in front of the mirror, and keep it between two to three minutes. Tell your story, because people are going to ask, why do you believe what you believe? And if you can keep that into two to three minutes, you'll keep their attention, and they get to hear the gospel quickly, and how God worked through your life. So, that being said, what did you guys like about what we read? I like that um, when you tell your story to somebody and they see the sincerity in your eyes and in your face, in your facial expressions, uh, they can share an experience in such a way. That's right. That's right. In, in a In a time that we live in where there's no truth, People take your experience as truth. It's kind of interesting, huh? Anything else you guys liked? You want me to tell you what I really liked? I have this underlined in my Bible and highlighted. It's verse 14. <clears throat> Listen to this. 14 to 15. This is Ananias speaking to Paul. He said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. Okay, number one. God, the God of our fathers, appointed you to know his will. What did Simple question. What did God appoint Paul to do? Know his will. Know his will. Now, what's coming after this is God's will. Not God's will for Paul's life. This is God's will. The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. Number one, to see the righteous one. God's will is for you to see Jesus and to hear a voice from his mouth. God's will is for you to see Jesus and hear his word. Number three, for you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen. That's number three. God wants you to see Jesus, hear Jesus, share Jesus. That is God's will for your life. Pretty interesting. That's actually awesome. <laughs> to I hear us. Say that again, Matt. I love you. Thank you, sir. Love you too, brother. Okay, anything else you guys liked about this? Okay, is there anything you didn't like? Okay. Is there anything you didn't understand? 
Yeah, why was his sight taken away, but then oh, given back? That's great. Okay. So as we go back to Acts chapter 9, that's when that light came down. <clears throat> and the, oh, excuse me. And the light was so bright, it blinded him. Have you ever looked into the sun and you couldn't see for a little while? Yeah. Okay, so imagine a light being so bright that you couldn't see for days. A welding flash. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. Here's another one here. Do you guys know who Gamaliel is? No. No, okay. No. You're going to see this name Gamaliel a few times in the New Testament. Gamaliel. Imagine um, if, if I told you that I went to Harvard, would that give some credibility to me? Yep. Okay. Only if individuals knew what Harvard was and understood it, they'd know your education. If they don't, it's irrelevant. Yeah, true. That's right. So now, Gamaliel, very important person. Number one, he was part of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, and the difference is, Pharisees, they believed all the Old Testament, and they believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees only believed in the five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And he was part of the Sanhedrin, which is the 70 ruling elders of Israel. So this is, <clears throat> even though at this time, Israel was run and ruled by Rome, these, he was part of the religious ruling class. Okay? That's number one with Gamaliel. The second thing with Gamaliel, is he ran his own school, like Harvard. And he was the top of the top. So if you were to get into Gamaliel School, it's not community college. You have to have a high, 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 grade point average, if you will, in Jewish law education before you even go to see Gamaliel at his school. So how how smart do you think Paul was in order to go to Gamaliel's school? Very. Very smart. Then, where's he speaking right now? Do you know where he's in? What building he's in? He's in the temple. In, the temple. in Jerusalem. Yeah. And he's telling them Right here, verse five at uh, verse four and five, I persecuted this way. Christianity was known as the way before it was known as Christianity. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders. That's the Sanhedrin can bear me witness. He says, if you don't believe me, talk with the high priest and talk with everybody in the Sanhedrin. He's giving credibility to his testimony. Check me out. Kind of cool, huh? Is there anything else you guys didn't understand? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um... Well, did, didn't Luke write Acts? Yes. Well, 
So he's testifying that Paul, so Luke is writing that, like, he was on the road approaching Damascus and a very mm -hmm. bright light from heaven. Okay, mm -hmm. so Luke witnessed this, is that? Luke witnessed Paul give his testimony. Okay. Oh, okay, so, so then that's why he wrote this. Yes, so <clears throat> okay. Luke accompanied Paul yes. his, at the beginning of his missionary journey, okay? This is kind of interesting. Okay. We're just going to take a small little rabbit trail. The economic climate uh, or the economic system in Rome was an owner slave economic system okay and when we think of slavery we think of american southern slavery with african americans and whips and cotton fields that's not how slavery worked here there was no such thing as public health care okay now luke was a doctor so a doctor didn't have clients a doctor was a slave and he was owned by an owner so luke was actually the doctor for a wealthy person at one time luke because Luke is in the temple recording this, means Luke's a Jew also. And we can conclude that his owner was a believer and let Luke go with Paul as Paul's personal doctor on the missionary journeys. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yes, but I have one more thing. Yeah. Why Why did Paul have to get baptized again? Paul wasn't baptized before. Oh, he was never baptized. Okay. okay. Circumcised on the eighth day, Philippians chapter 3, but never baptized. But so he was spreading the word of God and going through all this stuff, and he was never baptized? And now he's... Oh, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Great question. What is Paul doing here? Is this oh, happening is telling, or is Paul telling, telling his story? He's telling his story. Yes, That's he's telling right. his story. That's right. So this, what he's telling is actually Acts chapter 9. Oh, okay. So, okay. <laughs> Duh. That's a fair question, Gina. That's a very fair question. Okay. Does that does that make sense now? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, excellent. Thank you. Not a problem. Anything else you guys didn't understand before we move on? Okay. Well, let's let's ask the one more question. What does this tell us about Jesus? Everything that we talked about so far, what does this tell us about Jesus? I would say that because of Jesus, the word not only is the word getting around about him, what do you touch me for? Not only is the word getting around about him, it's how people are presenting the word, how people are talking about him, how it changes the, the nation amazing. or the, the amazing the people, insight. That makes sense. That's really good insight. Also, if you give your everything to Jesus, you will see and hear him. Like you have to give your all your faith and everything to, I think, to see and hear him. Yes. You guys are on a roll tonight. Anything else?
I think it tells us that he's he's got a plan and he's getting it like executing it any way that he can to get his word out and and use like and, and, and us that's through him. awesome observation Aw, awesome and we see how many parts does Jesus have to that plan <laughs> excuse me Verses All 14. of them. <laughs> yeah. But verses 14 and 15, how many parts does Jesus have to that plan? Three. Three. Remember, God is triune. Three people in the Godhead, three parts of the plan. See him, hear him, and witness. See him, hear him, share him. That and then God, Jesus, executes that three-part plan through who? Through us. 100% to Mary. See him, hear him, share him. Excellent. Anything else about Jesus that you guys have learned from this? Okay. We'll read verse 22 uh, to 29, and we'll stop there for the night. Uh, we'll pick up next week in verse 30, okay? And we'll and next week we'll work through verse 30 to the end of 23. <clears throat> up to this, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do, for this man is a Roman citizen? So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. So what you guys like about this? I find it interesting that he was born a Roman citizen and that he was still running around preaching about his experience, but a certain somebody that Rome did not want to um, express. Say that again, Lucas. I don't know if you cut out. I said, uh, I, I find it funny that Princeton? Okay. I find it uh, interesting that Paul, who was born, didn't you just say he was born a Roman citizen? Yeah, he said he was born a Roman citizen. Okay, so he's born a Roman citizen, and the Romans were not too happy with the idea of Jesus, correct? It wasn't that. Oh, okay. So, there were great privileges to being a Roman citizen. One of those privileges is you could not be crucified slash whipped slash beaten 
slash put in jail as a Roman citizen without a fair trial first. Anyone else was fair game. And if you were caught abusing a Roman citizen, you got the death penalty. So he was quite lucky. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. Did Paul use politics to save his skin? I oh, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. So, can but it was he... also beneficial that he could use that to continue uh, his mission to spread his word of Jesus as well. Mm-hmm. 100%. So, when we look at this, can we legally use politics to further the Word of God? Absolutely, we can. We can a use... Somebody right now, a certain 45 is doing that right now. Yeah. We can use the political system. Donald Trump talks a lot about God. Yeah, talking about God and talking about Jesus are two different things. God is very generic. Jesus is very specific. Anything else you guys liked about this? I liked he didn't get beat again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. God, just give me a break on this one. I've been getting beat a lot lately. Yeah. You think that Paul would have taken it? If they said, no, you're still going to get whipped? Yep. Yes. Yep. yep. He would have taken it. He would have taken it with a smile on his face. Anything else you guys liked? I like Paul's guts. He, he's got a lot of guts. Okay, let's let's talk about Paul's guts for a second here. How was Paul brought up? From what we read in this chapter, how was he brought up? Very high. Say that again, Steve. Like higher society. Sorry, higher society. Higher People. society. He was Higher brought up education. not to believe. Say right. that again, Kara. He was brought up not to believe because he was, if he was raised in Roman. Well, times, okay, so he, he was, was a Roman up. citizen, but raised in Jerusalem and studied oh. under Gamaliel. So he knew the Old Testament inside out and backwards. Right? But it right. wasn't until he became a believer that the Holy Spirit unlocked that for him. And he understood that this is all about Jesus and the gospel. Now, when we look at this, it's not his guts. It's his understanding of the Bible. When you understand the Bible, you will do what the Bible says. And when you get persecuted for doing what the Bible says, there's joy in that because you know there's a reward for you. 
kind of like this. Next year, I'm wanting to get into investing in real estate. Okay? We will be taking most of our money, putting it down as deposit to buy fourplexes. Okay? Will that hurt temporarily? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. But at the end of the year, will I have money coming back? Yes. Yes. 100%. Short term pain for long term gain. Paul is seeing his persecutions as an investment for his eternal reward. His eternal reward is not salvation, okay? Salvation is a gift. He's seeing these persecutions as an investment in his eternity. So if I rephrase that to I admire him for how he handled everything. Yeah, okay. I, I, I yeah, just so, admire it. Yeah. Yeah. Well no, no, it, it wasn't I think what you were saying was his bravery, his guts. Yeah. And what yeah. I'm saying is it's not his bravery. It's his knowledge. Yeah, okay. Well, how knows many of us what have the, that What knowledge? the Word of God says. And so mm. he's taking short-term pain for long-term gain. But his, his, how many of us alive today would go what through what, through what Paul did? Mm. So when I read, when we're reading this, I just, I just think this guy is like personally what he's been through. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like something else. That's all. I, that, that's what I no, meant that's by a hundred percent, Gina, a hundred percent. And I'm going to go back and say this to you. I've been saying this for 20 years. You guys are the exception. And have you noticed that I don't teach you guys anything? I just ask you questions. Have you guys noticed that? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. I just yes. ask you questions and I let you discover the Bible. And a year ago. That in turn, that in turn teaches us anyway. That's you right, may not it's be not teaching us directly. You. It's not me telling you, it's you discovering, which is a better way of teaching. Okay? Yeah. Now, Kara, a year ago, you never opened a Bible. Uh, no. And within a couple of weeks, you became a believer. In the summertime, I baptized you. You are bedridden sick right now, and you're in Bible study. That's right. Okay. Um, as that was last week. I missed half of it because I was like asleep, and then I woke up and realized I was missing it. <laughs> we understand, but what what I'm getting at here is the majority. You guys are not the majority. The majority of Western Christians are biblically illiterate. They have no clue what the Bible says. That was me too. That's right. And I'm 62 years old. And I still, uh, I still enjoy the first moment when you read First John chapter or, or John chapter one. Yeah. And the look on Kara's face when she figured it out what you were saying. Oh, it blew her away. I'm still trying to figure it out. Oh, dude. Okay, I got. Can I take a rabbit trail here? Just a little side thing. Of course. This might be a way too deep for you guys. 
But Ezekiel, it's either 26 or 27. Because I'm working on it's 27 or 26. Okay, there's 26. Where's 27? Okay, we got that. Oh, maybe it's yeah. Hold on here. That's the book I'm in right now with my daily Bible reading. Okay, well then I am going to bro blow your mind then. Hey. <laughs> You're so excited. Oh, here Gina. it is. 28. 28. <laughs> my mind needs some blowing here. That's okay. great. Okay. So this is um, <laughs> it's called it's we're going to start in verse 13, but the chapter is titled Prophecy Against the Prince of Tyre. Okay, and we're going to see that the that there's someone behind manipulating this Prince of Tyre, and you guys try to figure this guy out. And God is saying, "You were in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering: sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle." And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. Who do you think God's talking about? Satan. Exactly. Okay, now, this is where it gets kind of crazy. Did you hear all those stones that I listed off? Yeah. Sure did. Okay. Do you know that all of those stones are found on the high priest's vest? But the high priest has three more stones that this one's missing. I did not know that. Okay. No, it gets even better. It gets Ooh. even better. The stones, I have this done up for my own Bible study for tomorrow night. But the stones that are missing are jacinth, Agate and amethyst probably doesn't mean anything to you right now until you read Exodus 28, 15 to 20. All these stones are listed in order of the 12 sons of Israel by their birthright. Okay. Still probably doesn't mean anything to you until. You go to Genesis chapter 48. And that's what I'm working on as a Bible study right now. Anyway, the stones that are missing represent these three tribes. Gad, Asher, and Issachar. And it's Genesis 49, not 48. And so, Genesis 49, Jacob is giving prophecies to the 12 children, to the 12 sons. What will be accomplished through their tribe? Now, Gad says this.
Um, that's is well, okay, we're missing Isachar, so we'll go Isachar right here. Isachar is a strong donkey crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, so he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. Do you know what shepherds use donkeys for? To haul their stuff around? Protection. Donkeys protect the sheep from... Whoa. Yeah. Oh, they will kick, they will bite, they will do everything. They'll charge you. They'll, oh, yeah. They will protect the sheep. And then we see that he crouched down in these sheep to protect them. And then he took them to a resting place. Jesus is our resting place. That's number one. Gad. Well, let's talk about Asher, then we'll go to Gad. Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. Okay? Sounds kind of weird. Asher's food shall be rich. What do you do with food? You eat it. You eat it. Now, as we go back to John chapter 4, Jesus met that Samaritan woman at a well. And he basically shares the gospel with her. She becomes a believer. And she's going back to the town to tell people about Jesus. And his disciples show up because they went out to go buy food. They didn't want to ask him, why were you talking to a woman? But they said, Master, we brought you some food. And he said, my food is to do the will of God. That's number one. So Asher's food will be to do the will of God. What did we see the will of God was today? See Jesus, hear Jesus, share Jesus. Does food yield anything? No. How do you get a yield from something? What is a yield? Why I'm... What's that? When it grows. When it grows and produces. So when you do the will of God, it produces and it says his yield, his food, doing the will of God, will have a yield and it will yield royal delicacies. Well, in this, we see that Judah is the only royal person and Jesus comes from Judah. So the work that you do produces Jesus-like yields. That's number two. Gad. I got to find Gad here. Here it is. Verse 19. Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Now, Gad... It's a play on words. Gad in Hebrew sounds like raiders. So someone came to raid Gad, but Gad raided at their heels. In Genesis 3.14, God promises a Messiah. Okay? And that Messiah will stomp on the serpent's head, and the serpent will bite his heel. Gad raids those heel biters. The ones who belong to Satan, Gad goes into them to bring them out and protect them like a donkey, 
by doing God's work in sharing the gospel to produce Jesus-style yields. So now, when we look at the vestment for Satan, it looks close to the vestment for the high priest, and we see that Jesus is our high priest. And Satan looks almost identical. But he's missing a row of stones, of three. And that row of stones is people sharing the gospel. So now... Oh, I got you. Okay. Okay. Now, here we have it. Do you look like Jesus, the high priest? Or do you look like the knockoff version, Satan? They look almost identical. But the ones that belong to Jesus go out to share the gospel. And the ones who look like Satan don't, and they're in it for themselves. Who do you belong to? Jesus, the high priest, or Satan? Jesus. There you go. Jesus. Yeah, that is that is something else, isn't it? I, I had to get that off my chest. It was something I learned today. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. Share anyway, stuff guys, like that. Anyway, guys, that's the end of our study. Um, so I'm going to shut this down.